Uh, we're going to look at 1 Corinthians chapter number 9 here and read beginning in verse 24 as we continue to look at some principles that will help us have the most spiritually fruitful 2023 we can. And um, 1 Corinthians 9 and verse 24, the Bible says, Know ye not that they which run in a race run all, but one receiveth the prize? So run that ye may obtain. And every man that striveth for the mastery is temperate in all things. Now they do it to obtain a corruptible crown, but we an incorruptible. I therefore so run, not as uncertainly so fight I, and not as one that beateth the air, but I keep under my body and bring it into subjection, lest that by any means when I have preached to others, I myself should be a castaway. Lord, we pray that you'll help us now as we continue thoughts that will help us with spiritual disciplines. And uh, sometimes, uh, Lord, it's very easy for us to take these, even these precepts that we've discussed over many weeks, to take for granted that somehow or another they will uh, just appear on their own in our life. Uh, but I pray that you'd help us to realize that's not the case at all, that we must seek to grow in the grace and knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. And from the time that we're saved till the time you take us to heaven to be with you, that we must be a spiritually disciplined people. I pray that you'll help me, Lord, with again, with thoughts from this passage. In Jesus' name, amen. And so we've been looking at this race of life. Paul refers to life as a race. And uh, some of the different uh, encouragements and instructions, uh, edifications that we have, uh, both from this passage in 1 Corinthians chapter 9, and then also, as we'll see in a moment, from Hebrews chapter 12 and the first two verses there. Uh, and uh, to, to be clear, uh, to be spiritually fruitful uh, in your walk with the Lord is not going to happen by accident. It's going to take, as we have mentioned, as we have prayed just a moment ago, it's going to take discipline, it's going to take commitment, it's going to have to, uh, and it's going to require a willingness to endure uh, hardness as good soldiers of Jesus Christ. And so what that means is many times in our flesh, in our heart, in our mind, in our emotions, we're going to be challenged from time to time to throw in the towel because of the nature of the flesh. Um, and we have to remember uh, that uh, there are reasons for staying in the race, for staying in the battle. We discussed the, uh, the importance of the future crown uh, of the present crowd uh, that is our Savior and the saints and the skeptical that are watching our life. And uh, you and I have a testimony to somebody. Maybe some have uh, more of a testimony uh, uh, than others do with regard to the, their public testimony. Uh, but somebody is either being helped or hindered by your uh, walk in the Lord, your profession of faith, or your faithfulness or lack thereof uh, in some area of your life. And so... We have to remember that there's a crowd watching us, uh, and Hebrews refers to that. Uh, and uh, so not only though the uh, reasons, but then we started looking at the requirements. So what does that mean? What does that mean when we have, uh, uh, when we have folks uh, watching us and the Savior watching us? What does it mean? It means we've got some requirements in our life. Uh, we're supposed to be temperate. The Bible refers to that, uh, meaning that we need to have uh, this discipline, we said, uh, to stay in our lane, to, 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 to lay aside the hindrances, and to stay clean of sin from Hebrews 12 and 1. Then we said we're going to need patience. That doesn't mean uh, passively waiting. It means actively waiting. It means staying involved in the work of the Lord. Uh, the Lord said uh, when he comes, he wants to find us so doing. That is being faithful in our walk with him, being fruitful in our walk with him. Uh, and so we want to be actively waiting. And that patience, meaning to bear up under, that faithful spiritual endurance is going to require us, then we said, to stay faithfully focused. You know, it's very easy for us to lose patience when we don't stay focused. And so Paul said in verse 26 of our text here in 1 Corinthians 9, I therefore so run, not as uncertainly. 
And that word uncertainly uh, has the idea of uh, looking. It, it, it means uh, uh, that Paul did not want to be irresolute. He wanted to stay focused on the things that the Lord had uh, designed for his life uh, and to seek to be in obedience to him. Focus is a very, very important to the Christian life and walk. And uh, I think uh, any of us that have been around for a while, have been saved for a while, been part of church for a while, realize how easy it is to get off of focus. And the next thing you know, you're off a of track altogether. Uh, and so we need to maintain focus. We said everyone is looking somewhere, but too many are looking everywhere. Uh, and the end result is a scattered uh, approach to Christianity uh, and uh, one that has uh, less impact. Whenever I think about that, I think about the matter of light. You know, you can have a flashlight, and, and, uh, and especially with these LED lights, man, I'm telling you, you can really light the world up with those things. And, and all you have to do is get out here on 17 and have somebody in a big truck pull up behind you with them, and then you're struggling with the flesh all of a sudden. I know that's how I am. But, um, but anyway... <laughs> You know how bright those lights can be. Uh, but there's, uh, there's a, a great deal of difference between that power and light that is focused, say, in the form of a laser that has the power even to cut steel. And that's how we uh, cut steel in the plant there in Tennessee that where we worked before we came here uh, and had a big machine, had a laser, and that laser cut through various thicknesses of steel uh, for the parts that we to make the parts that we needed to build these uh, different kitchen uh, systems, and so uh, light, a focused light, is a powerful light. And you and I are called the light of the world. And we need to be a focused light, uh, having the most impact for the Lord that we can. So that means that we don't want to look to the past. We start looking in the wrong direction, and we're going to be going the wrong way. We don't want to look to the past. We 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 quoted Jesus' words from Luke nine and sixty two. Uh, no man having put his hand to the plow and looking back is fit for the kingdom of God. Not suitable. Uh, it doesn't mean they're not a part of the kingdom of God. It just means they're not focused in the right direction. They're not doing the right thing. They're not profitable to the kingdom of God and the work of the Lord when we're looking to the past. And we said that when we look to the past, we want to be careful not to look to prior defeats. Look at David and how David... Uh, messed up uh, in uh, his first attempt to take the ark to Jerusalem, uh, and uh, Uzzah lost his life, and David got discouraged. We don't want to look at past defeats. Matter of fact, we were careful to remind you that uh, David um, uh, let the ark sit for three months, and then uh, he heard of the blessing of God on Obed-Edom and his home because that's where they had set the ark aside, and David was reminded there is blessing in obedience to the Lord. There is blessing in the presence of the Lord. And so he went back and he approached the entire work with a biblical focus, following God's instruction, uh, and uh, the end result was the ark made it to Jerusalem and the people were blessed and David worshiped God and we looked at all of that. And so we want to be careful not to look to and live in prior defeats, but just as dangerous, we said, are prior victories. Prior victories can get us held up as well, looking to the past. Two attitudes we said we need to learn. We need to not be a sore loser or a worse winner. And too much focus on prior victories can cause us to fall prey to self-inflicted hindrances. We looked at some of those by saying, first of all, we inflate ourselves. I mean, if you've had any kind of victory or success in the past, it's easy to get proud about that. It's easy to get lifted up and think, uh, 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 you know, think that uh, we, you know, we become to be something. And we were reminded about how the Bible warns us against pride. It says that... Uh, uh, seven are an abomination to God. The very first on the list is a proud look. A proud look. Uh, and then we said not only when we look back to prior victories are we tempted to inflate ourselves, but then we also are tempted to ingratiate ourselves. And uh, what, uh, what the emphasis of that particular point was that we flatter ourselves. We begin to think that we are, uh, think of ourselves more highly than we ought to think. We begin to think more of ourselves than what we really are. And I think there are a lot of believers living in that state this morning, uh, uh, and uh, they're numbered among the has-beens and used-tos of the church uh, through the years, and uh, very often when they're trying to soothe a guilty conscience for not remaining faithful to present day, they go back and look in the past and say, oh, but wait a minute, you know, I really was something for Jesus. <laughs> and uh, the end result is they think they're something they weren't. 
we used uh, Samson as our illustration, you'll remember, and, um, and uh, how that he pined away in the lap of Delilah to the point where she clipped his hair, and next thing you know, he lost his power, and, uh, and, um, uh, and uh, then uh, he, uh, you know, the Philistines are upon you, Samson, and he said, I'll just get up and shake myself as I did before, but he didn't realize the Lord had departed from him. And again, he, he thought, he was, he thought he, in his present that he was the same as he was in his past, but, the, but what had happened in between those two things was compromise, uh, and uh, he lost his power with God. Uh, and so we, used, uh, we, we looked at Judges 8.21, for as the man is, so is his strength. Let's not think that we're something we're not. Let's be careful to not be thinking that, that um, you know, uh, falls and frustrations will not befall us. Uh, because it's very possible that they may. That's why Paul said in Romans 12 and 3, For I say through the grace given unto me, unto every man that's among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think soberly. And uh, I like the way the Bible puts that. The Bible does tell us to walk lowly. It tells us to walk humbly. Uh, but the fact of the matter is in Romans 12 and 3 there, he says we need to walk soberly. And that means uh, having a balanced view. Now look, you and I, without Jesus Christ, would be absolute reprobate. But in Jesus Christ, we are joint heirs with him. Amen. We are children of God, and we're a child of the king, and that's something that we can rejoice in and something that we can appreciate, but it's not ever anything that we should allow ourselves to be carnally proud over. Because Jesus said, without me, you can do nothing. So we're absolutely dependent upon him. We want to be careful not to ingratiate ourselves. The third thing we said is that well, if we continue to look to past victories, we will frustrate ourselves. And basically what that means is we'll frustrate our purpose. In looking to the past, we will miss present opportunity. And we took up a text in Ezra 3 uh, and uh, noticed how they had begun to rebuild a, a Jerusalem they started at the temple, they started at the altar, and uh, there was a mixed uh, a sound coming from the people. Some were rejoicing, others were mourning and weeping and crying, so much so that they couldn't tell the rejoicing from the weeping. And um, uh, because some were looking back instead of rejoicing in what God was doing at that moment, they were lamenting uh, the past. And so we reminded you of Solomon's words in Ecclesiastes 7 and 10, say not thou what is the cause that the former days were better than these? For thou dost not inquire wisely concerning this. The work of the Lord is not something he used to do. It is something he is doing. And you and I need to be involved in what the Lord is doing. If we spend too much time looking back, we'll frustrate forward progress for Jesus. Then I wanted to add to you this one as we pick up this morning. I left off here last Sunday, and that is this. Not only in looking to past victories will we inflate, ingratiate, or frustrate ourselves, but we can also deflate ourselves. And what I mean by that is that we can become discouraged. Now look, I, maybe, maybe somebody needs a reminder of this. I'm sure in this day and age uh, of social media and all this meism in the world, it's probably appropriate, but every day is not your birthday. Uh, every day is not a party. Every day is not, uh, uh, you know, a mountaintop. Sometimes it's just a long, dark, wide, cold valley. That's it. And uh, this was something Paul felt the need to communicate to those new converts and churches that they had started on their first missionary journey. I mean, you'll remember maybe the day, especially if you were saved at an older age, you'll remember the day that you trusted Christ as your personal Savior. And, uh, you know, as some have said, you know, the sky was bluer and the grass was greener and uh, the flowers were brighter and all that other kind of thing. And uh, thank the Lord for the joy of the forgiveness of sin and salvation in Jesus Christ. But life is reality. And before long, you begin to realize, hey, man, uh, this living for Jesus is uh, not something that's, gonna, that's going to, uh, you know, just happen. It's something I have to engage in. Uh, and it is a, it is a battlefield. Uh, it is spiritual warfare. Uh, and therefore, we have to realize that there is, there is very often going to be difficulty. And Paul didn't want these new believers 
uh, to become discouraged to the point of throwing in the towel because difficulties came their way. And so we read in Acts chapter number 14 and 22 where uh, they went to confirming the souls of the disciples and exhorting them to continue in the faith. That's the idea of patience. Continue in the faith and that we must through much tribulation enter into the kingdom of God. That's the truth of the Lord. And so we should be reminded that victories can sometimes be the fast track to becoming has-beens. You and I aren't the ones to decide when we've done enough. I hear that sometimes. It makes me a little bit nervous when people say, well, I'm going to do this and then I'm going to take it easy. Are you? And uh, who, who is, who is, who is uh, the Lord of your life? You or him? Who? You, you and I don't, uh, uh, don't have that uh, uh, authority, if you will. That's something that's determined by him. Jesus said in John 15, 2, Every branch in me that beareth not fruit, he taketh away. And every branch that beareth fruit, he purgeth it. That's the uh, tribulation. That's the trouble. That's the difficulty. He purgeth it that it may bring forth more fruit. In other words, he, he cuts it back not to shut it down, but to make it more fruitful. And I'm telling you one thing right now, one of the things we need in our day is more cutting down. We're too all uh, fired sure of ourselves. We're, we're too all fired full of ourselves, and the Lord's got to prune us back from time to time so that we can continue to be more fruitful. Now, think about this for a moment. There are times when we feel like the Lord is bringing us to the end of service, and maybe it seems like a continual uphill battle. Maybe it seems like constant trouble and resistance on every hand. And so we begin to think uh, that maybe uh, the Lord is bringing us to the end of service uh, when in reality he's merely bringing us to the end of self. Now, as an ex uh, example of this, we're in 1 Corinthians. If you'll turn to 2 Corinthians with me and chapter 4, 2 Corinthians chapter number 4 and verse 8. And uh, we're not talking about any kind of pie in the sky, some kind, some kind of shallow, well, I'm a little bit down emotionally today. Hey, we're talking about times in our life when, listen, there's the, the enemy has come in like a flood. There's, there's literal spiritual difficulty on every hand, almost to the point of seeming unbearable. 2 Corinthians chapter number 4 in verse 8 tells us Paul knew about that. He said, we are troubled on every side, yet not distressed. We are perplexed, but not in despair. Uh, I wonder if you've ever been perplexed. There are some people that believe that you should never be perplexed. Well, what do you do with Paul? Paul said, we're perplexed here. We're not exactly sure. You remember even with the Galatians, he told the Galatians, he said, I stand in doubt of you. I'm not exactly sure what's going on with you right here, right now, but it concerns me. Uh, and uh, Paul said, we, we are perplexed, but not in despair. Um, and uh, persecuted, but not forsaken. And by the way, let me say this because the thought came to mind. Uh, that uh, sometimes we have the idea that in the perplexing times of life, everything's going to be okay. It's going to come out on top. That's not true. If that were true, then why was Israel ever taken captive? If that were true, why was Jerusalem ever destroyed? Let me tell you something, brother. If you decide that you're going to be the wrong person and do the wrong thing, listen, you can mess up your life. And it's not going to be okay. There'll be problems and there'll be difficulties. And, uh, and uh, so this idea that somehow or another, here's the point of this, uh, that, uh, that in the end God's will is going to be accomplished. He is going to bring everything to the finish just like he said he would. But that doesn't mean that he's going to be using us when it happens. Because we may fall out somewhere. 
We may throw in the towel somewhere. We may become disobedient somewhere. Uh, and so uh, we do have these perplexing times of life. But he says, don't be in despair. Uh, persecuted, verse 9, but not forsaken. Cast down, but not destroyed. Verse 10, always bearing about in the body the dying of the Lord Jesus, that the life also of Jesus might be made manifest in our body. For we which live are always delivered unto death for Jesus' sake. You see what Paul's saying here? That there must be a coming to the end of self. If you and I are going to be used of God, uh, if we're going to produce more fruit for God, we're going to have to learn to be dead to self. The problem is there are too many that in promoting self give the, uh, give the impression that they're promoting the Savior. Many times I'm telling you that's not the case. And so he said we're delivered unto death for Jesus' sake that the life also of Jesus might be made manifest in our mortal flesh. And right there, probably many of you are running to Galatians 2.20. I am crucified with Christ, nevertheless I live. Uh, and so uh, verse 12, here's, here, here it is. So then death worketh in us, but life in you. Notice the focus of this. Completely not on self, but on the work of God in the lives of others. And so there are times when we feel like the Lord is bringing us to the end of service when in reality he's merely bringing us to the end of self. And that's why the Bible tells us in 1 Corinthians 15, 58, Therefore, my beloved brethren, be ye steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, for as much as you know that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. Now, if you're serving for yourself, that's in vain. If you're serving for your own ends, that's in vain. Uh, but when our labor is in and for the Lord, it is not in vain. The Bible says that we will indeed one day reap if we faint not. And so don't be looking to the past. Don't be living in past failures. Don't be living in past victories. Uh, but then also, let me encourage you, not only don't be looking back, but don't be looking to the left hand or the right. Have you ever noticed that phrase in the Bible? I don't want to, I don't want to go to the left hand. I don't want to go to the right. Uh, I don't want to get looking the wrong way. Uh, I learned in driving school, and maybe we need to send people back to driving school. But I learned in driving school that you go the way you look. Have you noticed that? Now, in the old day, back when we knew how to drive, before you changed lanes, you had to look. Nowadays, you don't have to look. The computer tells you. Uh, and, uh, but the back in the old days, you, and uh, I, I remember as a teenager learning how to change lanes and all that other kind of thing, that when I would look to the left, the car would go to the left. When I look to the right, the car, that's because we're not used to doing the opposite of what we're looking. And so if you and I uh, can just take that simple principle and apply it to ourselves spiritually, we'll be reminded that we're going the direction we're looking. And so what that means is when we talk about uh, refusing to look to the left or to the right, uh, the first thing we need to do is get our eyes off our neighbor. Looking to and focusing on other people. Uh, now, some of you may be in classroom, uh, either as a student or a teacher or an assistant or some, maybe a Sunday school teacher, I don't know. But there's always one or two students that when you point out what they're doing wrong, they're going to say, but so-and-so. And let me tell you something, it doesn't change from age. Uh, we have a tendency to look too much at other people. Uh, and the Bible says, uh, at least as far as justifying our own means, our own ends. 2 Corinthians 10 and 12 says, We dare not make ourselves of the number or compare ourselves with some that commend themselves, but they measuring themselves by themselves and comparing themselves among themselves are not 
wise. And so I would like for you to just be reminded here of Peter. In uh, John 21, Jesus tells Peter, he tells him what kind of death he's going to die, what kind of awful thing is going to happen to him. Uh, and uh, his, his first response to the Lord is, yeah, but what's this man going to do? And Jesus told him very clearly, he said, listen, if I will that he tarry till I come, what is that to thee? Follow thou me. Here's what the Lord was telling Peter. Focus on your own life. You, you make sure that you are following the will of God and don't be worried about comparing yourself with somebody else. Now, I'm going to tell you one thing. There are a lot of people that will take that principle and apply it incorrectly and will try to allow themselves by some sorry carnal interpretation uh, to, uh, to become uh, less than what they should be or to fall prey uh, to carnal pride. Or to say, well, I'm just going to be a rogue for Jesus' sake. You know, I'm not going to follow the crowd. I'm going to do my own thing. Well, there are certain Bible principles that apply to every Christian. Amen. And you and I are responsible to, uh, you know, the idea of just bucking the crowd. The only reason you buck the crowd is if the crowd's going the wrong way. Uh, and uh, there are a lot of people that are bucking the crowd going in the right direction just because they, uh, they want to be uh, their own person. Uh, they want to be their own, you know, that kind of thing. Well, the Bible refers to us, I'll remind you, also as a body. Especially in the context of the local church, we are a body. And everyone has a place and everyone has a function. And it's all got to work together if everything's going to come out all right. And when the certain aspects, I'm, uh, it is superfluous for me to mention it to many of you, but when certain aspects of your body fail, the rest of it starts having a problem. And so uh, you and I need to uh, be mindful of the fact uh, that uh, we're not talking here about being a rogue for Jesus. We're just making sure we don't uh, become guilty of comparing ourselves among ourselves. Uh, you know, uh, uh, like Paul said to the Corinthians, some of you are saying, because I'm not an eye, I'm not the body. Uh, well, maybe if you're some other part, you're still part of the body, and every part, you know, the, every part is vital to the, to the health of the body. And so uh, we need to be careful that not be comparing ourselves among ourselves, looking at other people. We need to be faithful what God's called us to as individuals. And God's got a purpose and a plan for every life. And that plan is going to include a, a faithfulness and service through a local assembly. Amen. Uh, sometimes you'll find people on this rogue way of life. They don't go to church, and they'll tell you, I don't need church. I, you know, I, uh, me and Jesus got a good thing going on, and it's going to come out all right. But the fact of the matter is, the Bible says, forsake not the assembling of yourselves together as the manner of some is. Pretty simple, really. We and we get our eyes off, um, uh, off of others. And then, uh, to make sure we don't turn to the left or to the right, we need to be careful to get our eyes off of self. Take your eyes off yourself, 1 Corinthians 10 and 24. Let no man seek his own, but every man another's wealth. Uh, you know, Paul said uh, in 2 Timothy 4 and 10, he was having a problem. He was having a problem because there was a great deal of work to do, and he couldn't find folks committed to the work. And he said in 2 Timothy 4 and 10, For Demas hath forsaken me. Why had he forsake him? Because he loved the present world. That's what the Bible said. He was looking to, to appease himself, to please himself, to satisfy himself rather than uh, dying to self so he could be used for the Lord. He also said that in Philippians 2 and verse 20, he said, For I have no man like-minded who will naturally care for your state, for all seek their own, not the things which are Jesus Christ. You know, here's the thing. Paul had a terrible burden because there were, the churches had need. The people had needs. And, um, <laughs> and uh, Paul looked around. And he said, I've, I've got no, I got nobody. I don't have anybody. Um, I, I don't, there's nobody available. They've all abandoned for some reason or another. Abandon everybody but themselves, of course. And so there's nobody to send. There's nobody to put in. 
There's nobody to assign. There's nobody to use. There's nobody that God can use. He said, I have no man like-minded. And so what were they doing then? Well, they were set aside. They were set aside. Uh, and um, uh, I, I put down this as a thought. Uh, you know, Paul said, I, I keep under my body and bring it in subjection, lest by any means when I preach to others, I myself should be a castaway. And that word castaway has the idea of being disapproved for service. It means to be set aside. It means to be put on the shelf. Uh, we discussed that back when we looked at the nation of Israel several weeks ago. Uh, but I put this down. The way to the shelf life is the self life. If you want to live for yourself, then God will have to set you aside. Uh, if you want to live for your own reputation, God will have to set you aside. That's not the way the Savior lived. He made himself of no reputation. Took upon himself the form of a servant. And so don't look to the past. Don't look to the left or right. But look straight ahead. Look straight ahead. Uh, ahead. Paul said in Philippians chapter 3 and verse 12, Brethren, I count not myself to have apprehended, but this one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forth unto those things which are before. <laughs> I press toward the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. I press toward the mark. Here's the point. Race the course not your companions. Now, I gave you this, I gave you this illustration uh, some time ago when I talked about uh, <laughs> wanting to ride dirt bikes. I mentioned that a couple Sundays ago. I don't want to do it anymore. But I, I did for a while. As, you know, that seemed like it was awesome. Matter of fact, I mentioned it, and somebody in this congregation today sent a picture and said, this is what happens when you do that. And, Broken bones and all that other kind of thing. They're laid up in the hospital. It's a good little reminder. Uh, but one of the things I mentioned to you by way of illustration is when, when, when these guys are out there uh, racing these dirt bikes and they get to looking at their companions, they very often lose ground to them. Uh, and what they should be doing is racing the course, looking to just try to create the, uh, the best time possible around that track. Uh, and that's what, gets the, that's what gets the job done and the victory won. So the Bible says in 1 Corinthians 3 and 9, we are laborers together. We are laborers together with God. We race the course, not our companions. And so that means if I'm going to do that, looking straight ahead, I need to look to heavenly things. As uh, Colossians uh, 3 and verse 2 says, set your affection on things above, not on things on the earth. I want to look at heavenly things. That's where I'm headed. The Bible says my conversations in heaven as a believer in Jesus Christ, I need to keep my eyes on those heavenly things uh, and uh, then also on my heavenly king. Now, in our text we've been using in Hebrews, let's go there. We've read it several times, but... Uh, Hebrews 12, and uh, there again in verse number 1, Hebrews 12 and 1, Wherefore, seeing we also are compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which does so easily beset us, and let us run with patience the race that is set before us. There's a comma there. Looking unto Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. I need to keep my focus on Jesus Christ. Now again, this doesn't mean I do that to the neglect of the brethren. It doesn't mean that I do that and try to pretend that I've got my own little thing with Jesus that, uh, you know, that can disregard all of the other biblical principles in the church of God. But it means that as individuals, you and I, or to keep our eye and our focus on the Lord Jesus Christ. That word looking there has the idea of looking steadfastly. It means to look intently. It means to fix, there's that word focus again, it means to fix the mind upon. He is the one that we seek to emulate. He is the one that we're seeking to please. 
He is the one that we're looking to obey. He is the one, of course, that we're looking to honor. And then if you look in verse number 3, it says this, For consider him. Think, you know, there are a lot of times uh, when life gets squirrely, if we would just be disciplined enough to think about Jesus, it would help straighten things back out. For consider him, look, that endured such contradiction of sinners against himself, lest ye be wearied and faint in your minds. There's something about meditating on and focusing on the Lord Jesus Christ and the example that he set for us in this life, his presence and blessing in this life, that helps keep us encouraged and strengthened from day to day along the way. And if we'll do this kind of thing, it'll help us. The word consider there uh, in verse 3 means to, it, it means to consider accurately and distinct, uh, distinctly or even carries the idea of again and again. You know what that means? Uh, uh, that means every day I need to look to him. Every day, fresh and anew, I need to put my attention on him. Every day, fresh and anew, uh, I need to focus on Jesus. And if I do that, two things will happen. One, it'll keep us on track. It'll keep us on track. Now, down there in Tennessee, we had a, a, a garden and some land to work and uh, had a small tractor, a John Deere tractor. Uh, and uh, down in that neck of the woods, there's all kinds of competition or whatever about tractors. Uh, and uh, some like Ferguson and others like uh, John Deere and all that other kind of farm all and whatever you want to kind of call it. Uh, and they'd get into these farmers, man. They'd get, it's, like, it's like being around guys that used to be in the military and that, come, uh, that rivalry that goes on between uh, people from the different branches. That's what goes on with farmers with regard to tractors. Uh, but I had a John Deere tractor, and uh, I was a little bit worried about it. I bought it with 240 hours on it. And uh, I, <laughs> I was asking some of the uh, some of the farmers down there at the store where Tammy worked, I said, now look, I've got this opportunity to pick up this little tractor. And uh, I said, but I'm a little bit worried. It's a John Deere. It's got 240 hours on it. And they said, oh, that thing ain't even got started yet. You know, that's like almost brand new. Well, one of the things about that tractor was on the front of it had a little silver arrow on the front. Uh, and, uh, you know, I, I never had really done much of that kind of thing growing up, so I thought the thing was a hood ornament. <laughs> so I'm like, well, that looks slick up there, you know, Paint, you know, chrome and all that, you know, everything still looked new. And uh, so I thought it was a hood ornament. Come to find out, it was put there to point the way. And you take that arrow and you put it on, your, on the place where you're going and you keep that arrow focused, you know. Uh, and boy, I'm telling you, there's a whole lot of, once I learned that, it was like a whole new world opened to me. Our garden was on a little slope. And if you weren't careful, instead of having straight lines, your lines looked like this, you know. Once I figured out how to get that arrow on the thing and keep on it, man, I'm telling you, straight lines. You know, same way when you're bush hogging the field, you know, uh, and it was only 33 horses, and had a, it had a five-foot uh, 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 bush hog on the back of it. Um, and, and so, <laughs> I mean, I thought I was something. It'd take me four hours to bush hog our field, you know. Uh, I thought I was something. And one time something happened. I don't remember what it was, but uh, Tammy said, hey, I, one of the, we, we weren't able to bush hog. The grass was getting high. And she said, I talked to one of the guys. They're going to bring their tractor down today and bush hog the field. I'm telling you, brother, you never seen a bush hog like that before. I mean, as wide as this pew. And it had those wings on it. And he come out there and got in that field and laid them wings out. And he was done in a half hour. I told my wife, I said, we need one of those. <laughs> I mean, two passes and he, the same, I guess the same fella, two passes and the same guy plowed our whole garden. Yeah. Uh, but the, anyway... <laughs> I learned by, you know, that if I kept that arrow pointed the way it's supposed to go, when I got done, everything was like it should be. Everything was in order. Everything was straight. Everything was right. And that's what happens when, uh, when we keep our eyes on Jesus. It helps keep us on the right track. 
It helps keep us on the straight and narrow. But just as soon as we look to the left or look to the right, you know. And uh, by the way, I found out not only did it help to get straight line, the lines when you plow, but then uh, I'd set up the, the, uh, the cultivator to help weed, you know, and lay those, uh, uh, I, I call them forks, in the dirt. Uh, and, uh, and, but you couldn't see what was going on. You couldn't look behind you. If you look behind, I'd be worried I'm going to dig them plants up, you know. And I'd be looking, looking. Next thing you know, what's happening to the tractor? The tractor's going like this, and you are digging them up. But if you get that arrow on that row of, uh, of uh, fresh corn or whatever it is that's coming up, just it can't do it forever, but you get it up going up there, and you keep that arrow on that thing, you can just go right down straight and never look back. And when you look back, you will have weeded every, every row just like, you, just like you plowed it because your focus is in the right place. There's a lot of people tearing up our churches because their focus ain't in the right place. They're digging up plants instead of digging up weeds because their focus is not in the right place. Their focus is on themselves. Their focus is on somebody else. Uh, and the end result is they're tearing up the garden instead of cultivating the garden. And so if we'll keep our eyes on Jesus, it'll keep us on track. But then also I'll say this. If we'll keep our eyes on Jesus, it'll keep us encouraged. It'll keep us encouraged. Now here's the thing. I thought of uh, this, the hymn, Turn Your Eyes Upon Jesus. It, said, uh, it says, of course, O soul, are you weary and troubled? No light in the darkness you see. There's light for a look at the Savior. And life more abundant and free. Through death into life everlasting he passed, and we follow him there. Over us sin no more hath dominion, for more than conquerors we are. His word shall not fail you, he promised. Believe him, and all will be well. Then go to a world that's dying, his perfect salvation to tell. Uh, and I think it's interesting that that hymn ends with the carrying out of our great commission the Savior's given us. How do we carry that out faithfully? By keeping our eyes on Jesus Christ. And doing so keeps us on track and keeps us encouraged. But it'll never happen if you lose focus. Now, I want to encourage you with this before I close, and that is this. It'll be good for all of us to realize that just because I have a thought doesn't mean it came from the Lord. Just because I have a philosophy doesn't mean it came from the Lord. Just because I have some direction does not mean it came from the Lord. The only uh, uh, confidence that we can have that that is the case is when we are first looking to Him. That's going to require the discipline of a right focus. To whom are you looking? To whom? To whom are you looking for your salvation? To whom? Not to what? And there's a world of difference between those two things, of course. Paul uh, told, uh, told uh, the, uh, uh, the disciples of John uh, when he was asking them about their salvation, have you received the Holy Spirit, the Holy Ghost since you believe? Uh, and they said, we didn't even know there was a Holy Ghost. And he said this, unto what then were you baptized? He never said unto whom. There are a lot of people that are looking at religion. They're looking at their own morality, which there is none. Uh, they're, they're looking to their own goodness. They're looking to their own intentions. They're looking to their own good heart. You ever heard somebody say, I know you have. Well, the whole world's really basically full of good people. Yeah. Where you live? Because the rest of us aren't experiencing that, right? Yeah. Uh, there are a whole lot of people looking to the wrong thing for salvation, the wrong actions, the wrong activity. You need to be looking to a person, and the Bible says that person is Jesus Christ. There is none other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. But then having been saved by faith in him, we also need to keep our eye on him the author and the finisher of our faith. The goal and the direction and the, and the traditions as we've been taught uh, from the scriptures, those were laid out for us by Jesus Christ. And the only way we stay faithful to that is by keeping our eyes on him. Are you?
Let's stand together and bow our heads for prayer. You know, through the years, and um, I say through the years with the realization that some of you this morning could look at me, even at 53 years of age, and say, what do you know about years? <laughs> but I would tell you this, I've noticed this, that the people that will be faithful through thick and thin, in and out, up and down, are the ones that keep their eyes on Jesus. Just as soon as their eyes are off of Jesus, the next thing you know, they're not in church any longer. They're not serving the Lord any longer. They found some other course and direction of life because they took their eyes off him. And you and I need to be careful to beware uh, that, we don't, uh, be, that we don't somehow or another believe that the same course cannot be taken by any of us if we refuse to keep our eyes on Jesus. Now, Lord, I pray that that would be the case today. You would challenge us with focus. And, uh, Lord, that we might remember that you are the one that sets the direction and the guidelines of life, and we need to keep our focus on you. I pray there may be someone in the auditorium that needs to trust Jesus Christ as personal, uh, personal Savior and not their own religiosity or not their own uh, good, uh, quote-unquote, intentions. But, Lord, to repent of sin and trust Christ. I pray if there's anyone in the auditorium this morning that needs to do that today, they will. And then I pray for those of us that know you. We're humbled by thoughts even just now through the New Testament of all the brethren that caused so much trouble in the churches because the focus wasn't right. Lord, I pray that would not be us, those that are in this place right now. And if it is, I pray you'd correct it by the power of your spirit to straighten out the roads, Lord, I pray. For your sake and the gospels, in Jesus' name, amen. Our heads are bowed.